get you on track. Um, so without further ado, let's get started. Tonight, we're gonna hear from Judy Rush. Um, Judy Rush is one of 10 artists in this current exhibition. Um, this is Expanded Dimensions, the Quilt and Surface Design Symposium 2020. This was curated by the director of the Quilt and Surface Design Symposium, Tracy Rieger. And um, it's gonna be up until January 8th. And we have a lot of really great virtual programming that you all can tune in for and uh, learn a whole host of things. And let me tell you, they actually truly did expand some dimensions here, um, particularly Judy. So uh, without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Judy and she is going to share her story and uh, you're going to enjoy it, I promise. different computer folks. Okay, so my name is Judy Rush and I'm primarily a fiber artist. I say primarily, I think because all artists work in all different mediums, some more than others. But I've noticed over the years when I'm working, I am looking to see the smallest possible part of the whole. So I'm constantly distilling the work down to the tiniest part. And I will go into some detail about what that means to me through the um, presentation. I think I'm working the work of many. I don't think I'm doing this alone. I think I'm being fed information from forces unknown to me or maybe known to me and I am not aware of them. Um, I, I'm doing things I wouldn't otherwise do like um, compulsively make um, 30 um, giant felted bowls without any goal in mind, yet here I am standing underneath them or sitting underneath them and they have a purpose now, they have a meaning now. So while I'm guided to do this stuff and I don't know why I'm doing it, I trust completely that I know that there's a good reason. Um, you'll see that the direction I've taken in my work has been and still is more of a um, spiritual or a mystical um, path. Um, I'm really interested in science, science's new discovery and in particular quantum physics, how quantum physics is starting to prove the mystical. Um, also quantum physics is um, starting to discover how fluid actually, how granular our um, universe and everything is. Um, I went to undergraduate school at uh, UMass Dartmouth. I got a BFA in textile design. Um, I graduated from there in 1979. The architect here was Paul Rudolph. And this is a pretty spectacular place to go to school, particularly art school because the sun would reflect off these buildings, these cement buildings in such interesting ways and colors that would come out from the ethers onto these buildings was pretty amazing. Like you'd see oranges and blues and yellows and greens where you wouldn't see them all the time. It was here that I first got involved in computer graphics. The last two months of my undergraduate school, this was in 1979, so there wasn't really computers available. We were just being introduced to them. So we were working with the pixel the single pixel. And we were turning a pixel on or off to emulate a, a textile design. So in 1980, um, I, I uh, went back to school, back to Ohio State and um, got a degree in uh, computer graphics, um, art education from uh, the computer graphics research group, which is now called ACAD. Chuck Surrey was the director at the time and um, the, some of my classmates were uh, Wayne Carlson and Maria Palazzi. Uh, both went on to become directors of that. Um, it's a pretty famous lab now. So kudos to them. This is a, some examples of my undergraduate work. I was primarily a weaver. And um, again, you can see that the, my interest was on the on off, the single pixel in, in the weaving. Um, so my kids grew up, oh, I actually had kids 
and then they grew up and I needed to do something else because I wasn't taking care of small children 100% of the time now. My youngest was 10 and uh, she was pretty much independent as she could be and um, I needed to move on. So I was started a class at a local quilt shop and the teacher turned me on to, to making quilts that weren't traditionally pieced um, pieces. Um, so I started doing these cartoony kinds of quilts. They were fun, I enjoyed them. I wasn't taking myself seriously as an artist. Um, I had lots of um, input from my undergraduate days about how an artist wasn't a woman and an artist wasn't a craftsperson. So my artist, in the artist in me was not at all confident in my ability to become an artist. But all that changed when I went to Egypt. I got to go to Egypt with some um, Egyptians and going to Egypt with Egyptians is the way to go because they know the language, they know the culture, they know the customs and you can get around a lot easier and a lot safer. The problem with um, going to Egypt in um, February of uh, 1998 was in November of 1997 there were uh, where there was the murder of 70 German tourists. So we were pretty nervous about going over there, but it ended up being a spectacular time to go because we could get into any, any venue that we wanted to go into. So Nefertari's tomb, which you're seeing here, was just opened like a few months before we arrived. It was gonna be the big highlight of our trip. And um, we had to get up really early in the morning and get down to the, um, the ticket center. But since we were tourists, we weren't having any interest in getting up early. So much, much to the frustration of our host, um, we got there around nine o'clock. But since there was nobody in Egypt and there was nobody in Egypt, no tourists, we didn't have any trouble doing anything we wanted to do. And that was the one instance that highlighted it. So. Unfortunately for the tourists, but fortunately for us, I mean, it was really weird, but fortunately for us, we got to go into a lot of antiquities that we probably wouldn't have been able to go into otherwise. The reason I tell you this is because this particular tomb had a great impact on my um, work to date. If you notice on the ceilings, there's stars. I, that um, motif, I use a, a great deal in my work and I'll point it out to you when um, we come up to it. But um, another, another feeling incident that went along with this particular trip was when I went into this tomb, I chose not to bring a camera in. I feel like I can remember feelings and concepts and colors and shapes better when I draw them than when I take a two-dimensional image that has no co connection to me. So I, um, when I went into the tomb, my notepad was dry as a bone. When I walked out of the tomb, my notepad was almost dripping and all of this moisture came from my hands. I think that's such a testament to the energy and to the excitement I was feeling about just being in that space. So moving forward, this is when I decided to become an artist. I walked into this tomb of the workers in the community tombs. Um, there they uh, in the worker section, when they build a tomb, they show the murals on the wall as depicting the life of the worker who is buried in this tomb. They're not sending these workers off to the afterlife with all these other things like the tomb, like the pharaohs have. Um, and so these were the artists, these were the bakers, these were the, the, the fiber people, the people who wove, the people who made clothing, who, you know, they were just the workers that kept everybody moving along. And that, that really affected me. And I thought, hmm, this is something different. So I came home and I'm still an insecure artist now. And now I need to do something with all of those feelings that I have inside of me. And I knew I needed to do it in art. Um, so I, I built these three um, quilts. The first quilt, on the left, the wheat fields in Egypt one was the first quilt that I ever entered into a competition. The first quilt that ever got accepted to the competition and it was also accepted into Quilt National. 
which was my goal. So the first quilt I show was, was um, shown in Quilt National, my goal. So now I have to find new goals, which wasn't very hard to do, but. Um, and then the other ones are just variations on the same concept, just trying to get the idea of what those wheat fields look like in those um, images in the tomb of the workers. If you notice here, I'm still working in a grid. If you, um, I, everything is a square. I'm kind of doing traditional piecing here, although not really traditional piecing. And I'm starting to get bored with this. Um, I really don't know where to go. I have to figure out a way to make a composition so that I can really invest time and, um, and ideas um, into my, my work. Um, so this is what I decided to do at that point. Still working in the square, still working with the boundary of the square. Order, uh, you know, I did a lot of work around what the square was meaning to me during this period. Um, so here we are in a square and I'm, now I'm trying to make an effort to change the dimension in the work visually. So it looks like it's floating or not floating, falling into the background, falling to the forefront, foreground and adding shapes and placing um, fabric in places where I normally wouldn't have placed it. So I was kind of moving in a direction that I was um, unfamiliar with. So I really had no uh, way to grow from there until I came to a Dorothy Caldwell class. And she's a Canadian fiber artist. I believe she's a Canadian national treasure, but I could be wrong about that, but I believe she is. And she was just putting fabric on black backgrounds and sewing them with white thread and stitching wherever she seemed to feel like she needed to stitch and sticking a piece of cloth in a random place and leaving it there and trusting it and believing that it belongs there. And this made such an impact on me. So um, I decided I would start to do a little stretching. So, and I say that laughingly because I decided I would sew on top of these square grid quilts that I had such um, an investment in and I was so worried I was gonna ruin them by sewing on top of them. Now in retrospect, I should have sewn up over top of the whole thing, but I, um, I didn't uh, have the courage to do that at the time. And if you could see over here, I even tried to add what I thought was this, you know, out there piece of fabric with no edges, no sewn edges. I mean, at the time that was such a stretch for me and just the black balance in the piece was a real stretch for me too. So I was really pushing myself here. Then after the Dorothy Caldwell class, I was also interested in the stitch called the Canthus stitch, which is a, a traditional Indian stitch. And um, I was planning on stitching on this quilt. One of the things I'm really interested in um, is hidden messages in art. For some reason, I have this notion that the masters would use the image, but create a composition that had a different story to it underneath the image so that the artist reality would be represented and the um, patron reality could be represented. So I'm thinking that there's hidden messages in a lot of art and they can, can come in different ways. They don't necessarily have to be overt. In this particular piece, I use fluorescent paint to uh, print on some words that I was trying to hide. I was trying to inject a message. I didn't want anybody to know it was in there. But as you know, fluorescent paint, when you put a flash to it, reflects. So you can see the words in this when you put a flash on it. So that was, uh, that was alarming. I didn't recognize that as I was building it. I was trying to it just hide all these words, but it was also very illuminating. <laughs> very illuminating and um, I uh, 
learned a lot from just building this, um, this work. So here I am trying to stretch myself again, not a traditional form. This is a hanky, um, 10 by 10 inch hanky. And um, just trying to figure out how to stretch myself, just doing some exercises, but I'm still box inside of a box, inside of a box, inside of a box. So I'm trying to get out of my own way here. And then I find the, the Fibonacci series or the golden mean. And um, this, um, I can't see this thing here, but it, I'm gonna, I think I can remember it. Um, math isn't my strong point, but I understand these concepts and I will try to describe them to you. So this mathematical model is A plus B is to A as A is to B. And what that means is when you add a square the same length as the AB, that new, the AB side, that new square becomes A and the old AB becomes B. And this square can, this, this diagram can grow to infinity. So it can grow to infinity and it can shrink to infinity. So it's, um, it's a pretty interesting construct. And then the, um, the diagram at the bottom is the, uh, the spiral that we see in nature so often. And this is created using um, these numbers to graph this shape. So here's a little video that will show you something. So show, show you how this works. So the way that these numbers are constructed is they are added to one another. Zero and one is one, one and one is two, two and two is three, two and one is three, two and three is five. So I will describe this in a little more detail, but you can see how it can grow and it can grow and it can grow. So this concept is extremely um, interesting to me. And if you see right here, you start out with this one and one, two sides together, create a two. And we create this square that's two by two as a result of A. And then we cre create a new square that's three by three as a result of A, B, and A. So we just keep growing it and growing it. And here's the series. So zero plus one equals one, and this is exactly how this, this series comes about. Then you take the next two numbers and one plus two is three, two plus three is five, three plus five is eight, and the sequence increases that way. And you can see how this um, diagram develops. So, and here are some of the um, applications that I have discovered, I haven't discovered them, I've discovered the imagery, imagery in, um, to, show, to be able to show you and to work with it so that I can understand it better. So um, I've discovered this imagery online for free for everyone. I think it's so interesting that the body so perfectly represents the uh, Fibonacci series or the golden mean. So if you just look at your, your finger, your finger from your knuckle, from your hand knuckle to your to the first bend is in direct proportion to the to your next knuckle, which is a direct proportion to the next part of your finger. So it's it's all in this um, three to five ratio. So if this were to measure five, this would measure three. And these kinds of things are happening all over your body. I think they used it extensively in art at some point, just, and this is where I think they used it to create the message. They would create a composition that had one message going on, and then they would create the image over top of that, using that composition to be able to um, generate messaging in different places. I think it's pretty interesting in the Last Supper painting by Da Vinci, who we know used this series quite a bit, kept, everybody, but um, Thomas the Apostle and um, 
and Jesus out of the center. And Mary Magdalene, you can see, is almost like stretching really hard to be out of this, out of this frame. So this is all part of my idea that this is a valuable tool in creating composition for um, my work. So here's a, a Miro, who I think it's a pretty simple image. So it was simple to, to map. So I took this, uh, this um, golden mean, this golden spiral, and I just tried to map every line on there to give you an idea of what I'm doing as far as when I say mapping an image. So all these, all those curves on the golden mean are curving around the lines on this image. Um, this is not to say this was Miro's intent. This is just to say this is my exploration. And then when you take the image away, you get this different kind of energy around a composition. So when I look at this Miro, I see a very weighted bottom. And I also see the life pushing up, but it's a happy movement up, but also moving down. So when I take this composition towards it, I can almost see that activity of the up and the down in just the lines. And that's really um, what draws me to um, this method of creating a composition. So I've studied this painting for a long time. This is a little street by um, Vermeer. Um, I've studied um, how he made this painting and whether or not it's composite or whether, you know, just his thoughts about this painting. One of the things that came up was that he put his profile into the painting. So already I'm getting messages and this little red area highlights where the profile is. So already there's hidden messages in this particular um, painting. So here's his profile. I don't know if it's an accurate profile. I just know it's a profile. All right, so let's put that aside for just a minute. Again, it goes to hidden messages in the, in the painting. So I just use triangles, circles, and squares all in the, within the mean, and, and I have a line in there as well, all within the golden mean to try, and this is my first attempt at mapping out a painting, to try and use that composition that I get from this mapping onto another, um, onto my work. This is a resulting piece, but I just kind of wanted to show you side by side before I went into any more descriptions. So here's the composition on the left before I built the piece. And this is the, how the composition lays on the piece. So again, this is my first effort at trying to do this. And um, it was pretty fun, I have to say. I really felt a lot of um, satisfaction in doing this. And now I put my head into the shape. You can see how I'm putting that particular, my face into that message. And now you can see where my face was during the um, building of this, this particular quilt. This quilt is my own politics. It has nothing to do with politics per se, but that's the title of it. Um, again, this is the same composition on a different piece of work. And I highlighted different parts of that composition on this particular work. This piece is waking up, is on tour with a um, with abstracts and um, geometrics and abstracts by Martha Seelman. Um, I don't have my notes with me um, easily, so I don't really remember. I don't know if I remember the title of the book correctly, but. Um, I was, I'm a featured artist in that book, and this, this quilt is currently touring that um, book sale. So touring, I don't know where it is right now, I think it's in the United States, but it's been going all over the world. Um, it was supposed to be out for two years, and I think we're going on three years now, so it's getting a lot of uh, miles. So this is where I took this whole Fibonacci series. This is my daughter. I started using the, the golden um, spiral 
to map out every part of her face. You can see how I took the center circle and mapped out her cornea. And then I moved over and mapped out her whole eye and her eyebrow. So you can see the development here and then finally her whole face. And then I took just parts out that I wanted of, from that composition and I made that the composition. And so here you can see the composition that I used and the quilt that was um, built using this particular composition. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a series I did on my youngest daughter. Um, the Portrait of the Younger Girl 3 has um, audio tape in it. That's the first time I ever used objects that were not fiber. The Portrait of the Younger Girl 1 is, has been purchased by the Greater Columbus Con um, Convention Authority. I believe that's the title of their organization. And it's now on display inside the convention center. And they also took that piece and uh, took the image and applied it to tile and surrounded a elevator in the um, basement of the uh, convention center hotel. It's pretty cool because when you walk into the dark um, uh, garage, way in the back, you see this bright yellow beacon of light. So it's pretty cool. I'm, you know, it's pretty cool for me to be able to be a part of that. So I'm still working in a grid because I'm making all these little squares, but you're not seeing the grid as much. So I'm kind of really taking my time moving away from the grid. I it's a comfort area for me. It's an easy way for me to manage the, the material. Um, and I'm still working through that. <laughs> so um, the piece on the left is, um, I forget which daughter that one was, but that's a daughter and the piece on the right is my middle child. This is another composition from um, my oldest daughter. Then in, was it 2015, I got to go to the Netherlands. I don't have that page. I believe it was 2015, I got to go, go to a Nether the Netherlands for three, month, three weeks and I stayed on a farm in um, south of the Hague, west of Rotterdam. It was pretty um, remote. It was pretty cool. The old, it was a very old farm. These farms have been in people's families for hundreds and hundreds of years, like 600 years in some instances, maybe even more. It was also really interesting. I thought this was a pretty cool social thing. This particular co-op of farmers over the years have been picking up parcels of land and their farm was no longer contiguous. So this co-op decided that they were gonna make everybody's farmland contiguous and they actually were able to accomplish that. So when you think about farmers being in an environment over thousands of years farming that same land, or let's go hundreds and hundreds of years to make it even a simpler um, situation to be able to re make all those um, land masses contiguous for the benefit of the farmer, I thought was pretty spectacular. But, you know, here again, there's squares everywhere. So I'm loving this. So when I'm in the Netherlands, I'm, I have no, I have very limited materials. So I have to work with the materials there. I had flow, flew over, so I get a suitcase. Uh, wool was plenty available and there were a lot of felters in the Netherlands and my host was actually taking class in felting. Um, so she it turned me on to wet felting. This was the first piece I made when I was in the Netherlands and um, this piece is called the load carrier. The way this was constructed was it's wet felted but the wet felting I did was wrap wool around a piece of cork add water, hot water and soap and just kind of make it condensed and then felted it and felted it, felted it until it was just holding together, threw it in the dryer and let the dryer finish felting it. And what that does is create um, unusual parts to the um, object. So when this piece came out with the center, the body of this piece came out was exactly in the shape of a heart and it had all the crevices of the heart 
So I chose to use it for the body of this uh, load carrier because definitely this load carrier needed more heart. This is another piece I did while I was in the Netherlands. I finished all, all these pieces after I came back. I just started them there. This is another one, Rhea, short for Menorrhea. Um, her, um, you can see her, the um, yellow loop that's holding what I call the menstrual cup underneath her is a, is a tag um, from the dryer. It didn't seal into the rest of the um, ball of felt. And I had to manage this little piece. And this is, it's interesting to me because I can take those little pieces and redirect them in ways that make sense to me. So in this particular instance, I was able to give her a little holder for her menstrual cup. This is Muji calls her Judy. She's really fun. And she wanted to be a ballerina, but only had one eyebrow. This is my commentary on beauty. I mean, she's got so many things wrong with her, but she's missing an eyebrow and that's the one thing to disqualify her from becoming a ballerina. This is my homage to Hunter Wassert. Hunter Wassert built um, some structures, apartment buildings, and they had green space around them. So you could literally drive up to your story on the green space or walk up to the story on your green space. I think that's a fascinating idea. If you look in that little hole in the middle, you can see there's a little life going on in there. But this is House Mother. And seeing my world with new eyes is my first um, effort at using other materials in a felted environment that wasn't felting, felted or wasn't used as a joint or holding things together. This was just to use the glass in a way that I felt was interesting. Um, you can see I'm still using the square a little bit, but I have moved pretty far away from this was a piece that I made in response to a um, invitational um, to respond to somebody else's artwork. So that's what this piece is. And now we get to the bowls. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how I make these bowls. They start out as a flat piece of fiber. I lay each layer of fiber out by hand. So each, so I'm just pulling off a little bit of fiber at a time. So I'm working with the single fiber, quite literally. Something to note, the fiber has no strength, but in combination with other fibers, that's where it gets its strength. You can pull a piece of fiber apart and not even know you're pulling it apart, but if you put it in concert with other fibers, you will have not, you will not be able to pull it apart. Um, so anyway, excuse me, I put, um, I, I get this flat square piece of felt just to a point where I can pick it up and manipulate it, wet felt it. And wet felting is when I wet felt something, I put hot water or warm water, warm soapy water on it. And then I roll it up in a piece of bubble wrap. And then I'll just roll on it gently for like 50 rolls, let's say just one, two, three, four. And then I'll unroll it, turn it a quarter of a turn, roll it again, turn, unroll it, turn it a quarter of a turn. I'll do that four times. So I'm rolling it about 200 times and that makes it stable enough that I can dr now drape it over a, um, an exercise ball. And, you can, and then I'll cut the excess off because it's a square. So you're gonna have all these little flaps coming out. So I'll cut that excess off and create the shape of the bowl. That excess I'll attach to the bottom of another bowl or another, um, or at create another bowl using that excess. So you can see this bright pink came from some other place and it was added later. After I add these pieces on, I'll continue to felt it and felt it even more. These pieces will not, would not hold up this way without a harder on them. The hardener that I use is a mixture of glycerin and gelatin. So it's non-toxic, it's called bioglass. You can get the recipe at the, uh, the Columbus Public Library. Um, 
and it's it it's not a permanent solution, but it does a pretty good job. It's still fiber, wool fiber in particular responds to um, moisture in the air. So if I don't have a hardener on it, it's more likely to change shape with without intention. But even with the hardener on it, there's going to be some moisture in the air and it's still going to start to want to bend in the path of least resistance. So all of that stuff is still very interesting to me. This is not permanent. If it gets wet, I have to reapply the, um, the hardener. Here's some more bowls. This is two bowls put together. A little pawn. So you can see the stitching really clearly. Being an insecure artist, I'm thinking that stitching at first is a problem. And you know, now as I look at it, I think it's the most amazing part of it. Some more bowls. So this is what happens to the bowl if it is not, if it has too much moisture um, attached to it. It just kind of folds in on itself like a pod. Not a bad thing. So I'm learning how not to try, I'm learning not to try to control the material as much as I am learning how to let the material teach me what it needs or what it wants or what it can do. So I moved out of my um, large studio into my home studio recently. And as I was doing that, I stacked all my bowls up from smallest to largest. And um, this is one of the arrangements I came up with. I just thought that was pretty cool, the different way of looking at them. I also make giant felted bowls for people to get into. I have three at, in different stages right now. I have one that's completely felted, one that's partially felted, and one that needs to be started. It's still in a more fragile state. What I did here was I created these bowls and just brought them to a state of felting where it wasn't felted, it wasn't stable, but I'm, I want people to get into them. People have body heat and their body has moisture. So when they roll around in a, in a felted bowl, they will continue to felt the bowl. So that's what I mean when I say I have one that's already been felted. There's been a lot of people in this bowl and they've felted it completely. And then I have one that's partially felted. Not as many people have been in it. And I have one that people haven't been in yet. So here I am in one of the bowls. So you can see it pretty much is, fits my body. I've had six foot five inch people in these bowls and they have no problem getting into them or getting out. Um, but the overwhelming thing that I think is so interesting about these bowls is trying to get adults inside of them is, is daunting. People don't want to embarrass themselves. But once I get them in there and they push their feet all the way out and push their shoulders all the way back and just try to find their way inside the bowl, you can see their face relax in that moment and they they sigh, oh, this is cool. And this happens all the time. Everybody who gets in the bowl is scared of it at first, but once they're in it, it just encompasses them with something that makes them relax immediately. You can see their face just relax. So that's pretty cool. First time I hung my bowls was at the um, Cultural Arts Center. So you can see the light through here. This is um, my, I've, I've started needle felting as part of my felting career. This particular piece is needle felted and, and wet felted. The carriage is a wet felted piece. Needle felting uses a needle, no water. So when you're felting, you're literally just pushing the air out between the fibers. So with needle felting, you're using that um, needle to push the air out, to push the fibers closer together and push the air out, the space between those fibers and condense the fibers. And wet felting, you're using um, heat, moisture, and agitation to put that, push that 
air out between those um, fibers. So I like the contrast between the detail you can get from the needle felting because you were literally just pushing fibers around with a single pointed needle. And um, with the randomness of the wet felting, you don't have as much control of the, with the wet felting. So this um, character is called they. The plan is to eventually dress this being with, you know, non-specific gender clothing. Um, I want this um, being to be fluid. So that my goal is to eventually have a trailer behind this being with uh, a wardrobe of sorts. There's a close up of the face and the hat. And there's a close up of the back and leaving you with an open heart. Thanks very much. Oh, yes. And now we're off to my installation. We'll talk about that. I can't talk to her. Grandma. Can't hear you, bud. What? All right, so we're gonna take a look at Judy's installation. She's gonna guide us around and tell us how this came to be. Speak loud. Okay, can you hear me? So for simplicity of explanation, I'm gonna to refer to these two as masculine and the bowl as feminine. They're not necessarily those things, but I think that's a simple term to be able to describe to you what I think happened. So this installation was supposed to go in in the spring, but COVID happened and the whole installation so I made these two to go with this installation. And again, this is another instance where I didn't know why I was making them, but here they are. Um, so I see these two as normal. This is, you know, vertical, straight up and down, nondescript. They're, you know, interesting by themselves, but normal. And so this, everything's going along just fine, and these are the rules. There seems to be some need to change the role, not everybody's happy. So we moved into a more orderly grid like environment. Again, I'm referencing the grid. And um, these are rules that are very clear. Everybody knows what the rules are. Everybody should be happy, right? Well, that doesn't necessarily work that way. And uh, so, this works for a little while and we start to move out to incorporate the masculine shape with the feminine shape, with the curves and straight line. And we were getting large bowls, but we're also just kind of introducing the idea of a bowl into the, um, the masculine energy. And soon, very soon, the masculine energy gets taken over by the feminine energy of the bowl. And they actually start interacting in a way that starts to make more sense and makes them actually more interesting. But there's lots of there's lots of conflict. I mean we get we get breakdown and we get shape shifting, we get change everywhere. Um, rift goals, big holes, um, the the um, tubes going through and um, inserting themselves into the bowl and inserting themselves and actually becoming part of the next stage of the energy shift, which is just new universes, new energies being created. And of course this has a reason, we don't necessarily know what the reason is, but of course it has a reason we're getting new universes beginning to have 
a clock. The universe is already implanted in these spaces. New, new in universes that we never thought we'd ever have. Universes inside of universes, sparkly universes. And then all of this energy comes down on the tail of the day. So this character is really kind of embodying all the energy that is um, behind, behind this character. Um, I would I like to think that they um, created all of this energy. I guess that's one way of describing it, but or or they is a result of all this energy. It's hard to say, maybe it's both. It's really hard to say. But that's how I'm envisioning this installation. And uh, let's have some QA. Okay. All right. <laughs> Hey, Grandma. Grandma. Hi, Lucas. <laughs> hey, we like your show. Like you need to show. mute, Anna. Yeah. All right, we have comments. Uh, Sue Cavanaugh said, great job, Judy. Awesome. Oh, thanks, Sue. <laughs> ben said, beautiful. Oh. Uh, Debbie said, the installations are so cool. Uh, let's see here. Someone who is listed as iPhone said, you're my hero. Yes. Yes. Um, Audrey said, I love the colors. Mm -hmm. Can you oh, see the rest of that question? Oh, yeah. I love the colors. Can you talk more about that? Oh, colors. Hmm. Um, I like bright colors. I like the idea that in cultures where people are supposed to be so poverty stricken that um, they use color. I can see your head. Oh, sorry. That people, cultures that are poverty stricken use color as a means of celebration. So I think it's striking that in the United States, I think it's striking that in the United States, we um, want all of our interior of our homes to be muted and um, in, in like places like uh, um, Mexico, the inside of their houses are just bright and, and um, fun and just a fun place to go. So I like using a lot of color and I'm not afraid of color. I'm not afraid to experiment with color. So does that answer your question, Audrey? There's another question it, um, from Joe said, colorist question mark, what do you use? Oh, I dye my own wool. I use a, um, I use a uh, it's been a while, Saperset dye to dye the wool. I've been finding, it's really hard to find dyed wools or dyed um, fibers that have really bright colors. You can dye your own and get those colors. I'm starting to find more and more vendors that are able to do that. And as I get older, I'll probably start buying more of my wool because it's really, it's really um, physical to dye. Um, dye yeah. wool, D-Y-E. It's also <laughs> physical to dye, but I'm not doing that. Ben would like to know, how did you get the bowls to float? And what about those stars? Oh, thanks for reminding me. So. You can see right behind my shoulder, you can see some of the iconography of the stars on my bowls. And they're pretty much in all my work everywhere. Everywhere you look, you'll see that motif. Um, what was the first question? Uh, how did you get them to float? Oh, fishing line. <laughs> right. 
Um, and it was Abigail that said that you're her hero. That what? Abigail, it, she said, that was me, Abigail, the second daughter. She is my hero. Oh. <laughs> um, and then we have a question from Amy. Uh, Judy, could you talk about how you relate the artist or individual action of creation and the universal act of creation? Can I talk about what about that? How you how do you see yourself or all of us sort of like participating in that or? Oh, I think we're all constantly creating. I, I think people who say I'm not creative just boggles my mind because your body is constantly um, dying off cells and rebuilding new cells. So you're constantly creating. Even if that's your only creation, that's still a big creation. That's a huge thing. So um, we are constantly in explosions. Um, oh, at the beginning of this, of my um, show, showing talking to you about the installation, I wanted to let you know that I'm, I've developed this quantum physics um, um, interest. And um, the interest, the thing that I have found about quantum physics is they're trying to find the smallest particle of matter possible. And the one thing that they discovered was a, the smallest possible particle cannot be a point because a point cannot grow. A point, once a point is grows, it becomes a line. So they have decided that the smallest particle of matter has to be a line or what they call a loop. So a fiber is a line. So here is, when I found that out, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, quantum physics, I'm focusing on just the fiber and what it can do in concert with one another. So I am just working with a line. So I'm trying to bridge that um, metaphysical um, experience that I have in my life with the science, with the actual communication of it in some way, somehow, because I'm not a very good talker. <laughs> Shar Norman would like to know, it said, love this work. Where do you see it going next? Oh, that's a good question, Shar. I think I just keep working. And then when it just, things start to develop into something new. When I started this particular project, I only had bowls. And that was as far as I could conceive them going. And then COVID came along and it just changed everything for everybody. I mean, the whole world is gonna be different after COVID um, as it has been after every major um, virus outbreak major changes in the culture has occurred. So I don't expect this to be any different. And with that change is gonna come the influences of um, how this work changes. So I'm really interested in responding to that, um, that change. I find um, it very interesting indeed that we are alive during such um, great change. That's not my quote. That's um, Angela Davis's quote right after um, the 2016 election. She came to Columbus State. So I think that's, I think we are very fortunate indeed to be alive during a time of great change. So um, I can't tell you where this is gonna go. I, I, I would like to think that I could, but that's not satisfying either. I like to see it grow on its own and see what, um, what form it takes. Barb Vogel said great efforts and uh, the executive, executive director of OAC, Donna Collins, said joyful, interesting. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's see if we have any more um, questions. Oh, how long did the installation take to be set up in the right? Ooh, 10, 11, 12. So well, maybe about 12 hours with two, with two and three people helping at all times, not including me. So it, it was, uh, it's nice to have preparators. <laughs> um, Judy, I'd like to know, you've evolved quite a bit in your artwork. Um, and I think that this exhibition is a lot is 
the real tenets of it, the idea of it yeah. is pushing past the expected. Yes. So can you talk a little bit about how you found yourself in this position and where you seek inspiration? Um, I think my insecurities pushed me in a direction towards a meaningful end. So I knew I, I, knew I was an artist, but I was not secure about that part of me. And I think that this was the way with which I created that confidence, Create, just making art and making work and making work, and making work. So um, does that answer the question? Absolutely. Okay. Who are you looking at right now? Artists. Artists? Yeah. Hmm. Golly. Or what are you looking at that's inspiring you? Maybe not people, but... I'm looking at a lot of um, craft things that aren't run-of-the-mill, like craft, like objects found in, uh, in a junk drawer, let's say, that I never saw before and what its purpose is. Um, you know, you ask me really quick which artists I'm looking at, and I, you know, if I had my computer in front of me, I'd say blah 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 blah. But I, um, I can't think of names right now. I, I like contemporary artists better than the old, the the old dead artists because I think I'm a contemporary artist, and I want to associate associate with people like me. So I want to know what people are thinking now. I also want to know what Vermeer was thinking at the time he was alive, but um, right now I, I think that what contemporary artists are um, talking about is pretty interesting. All right. Um, we have Jennifer Hudson. Hi, Jennifer. A question, uh, or actually a statement in the question. Love your work. Body bowls are most interesting, but realize COVID makes it difficult to work into the exhibit. And that's from Paula Ness. So it's more of a statement. Right. Um, and then we have another question from Amy. Is there a hidden message in the bowls? Oh yeah. And the hidden message is more to do with the energy. I think whenever you touch something, you put, you put whatever your energy is into whatever it is you're touching. So. When I make a mask, for instance, and I give you the mask, I have touched every single part of it. You put it on your face and um, you start to incorporate my energies into your energies. And inherent into that is um, the message, you know? I don't, and the message is different for you than it is for me, but it's still a message. And it's not necessarily coming from me, but it's universal energy that's coming from all right. I, is there anything else that you want to talk about? No. <laughs> All right. I'm going to pull it back to me. Okay. Do I need to unshare? Good job, mom. Love you. All right. Thank you, Thank everybody, you everybody, for tuning in, in and enjoying this, this um, um, wonderful oh, artist this. talk with Judy. She, yeah. you know, it's hard to, hard to imagine someone being better at articulating the enthusiasm behind their work than Judy. So really, really thankful for the time and for you all joining us. Um, this is the Ohio Arts Council's Rife Gallery. I'm Kat Sheridan, uh, and I'm very pleased to be the director of this space. And this is Expanded Dimensions, the Quilt and Surface Design Symposium Exhibition for 2020. Um, and again, be sure to check out the rest of our programming that we have